So uh, Carl Rose was my friend and uh, collaborator, close friend and close collaborator for over 10 years. And I'm really grateful to Gene and the University of Illinois for rededicating the Institute uh, towards his name and for making this uh, wonderful symposium uh, possible. So I'm going to talk about uh, some uh, aspects of uh, evolution and universal biology uh, that we've been doing. Uh, Carl participated some of the, in some of these things. In others, uh, they were the continuation of thinking that uh, we had done uh, together. So the first question I want to ask is, uh, what is universal about uh, biology? Uh, now, of course, uh, uh, when you start doing biology as a physicist, the first thing that people tell you is that everything in biology has an exception. And when I first started talking to Carl, he said, no, that's completely wrong, because everything in biology came from evolution, and there's no exception to that. And uh, evolution is the sort of unifying principle uh, of biology. So uh, I, I, uh, I want to show this picture here. This is the logo of our NASA-funded uh, Institute for Universal Biology. And uh, I want to uh, walk you through uh, what this uh, logo actually means. Some of you may have seen this. It's not just a fanciful uh, construct. It actually has some scientific meaning. So of course, this element everybody here uh, undoubtedly recognizes. This is uh, the tree of life. And you see that the tree of life is emerging from this network of life underneath. That's uh, the phase that, uh, that uh, Rose and Fox called uh, the progenote phase. And it's a phase uh, where, as you'll see, where life is uh, dominated by horizontal gene transfer, at least of the core uh, translational machinery that later came to be the basis for our definition of what a species is. And so you see that there's some kind of transition between these two things. And uh, then uh, you see this uh, structure on the outside. This is meant to be a DNA uh, sequence, some kind of genome sequence, but it's also meant to be a, a spiral galaxy. Uh, that's meant to be the kind of part of universal that uh, NASA likes. They like to think of uh, biology in other places than Earth. But we think of uh, universal as meaning something different, meaning something that is shared uh, by all life that we know about. Now, I'm not going to talk about spiral galaxies because I don't know anything about them, but I do want to talk about something very similar to that, which is uh, chiral molecules. And chiral molecules, uh, the molecules of life, uh, also have some kind of universality. They have a homochirality. They have a particular handedness. And that's something that is universal, and we're going to talk about that. So in summary, uh, there's a number of things that are universal about life, and uh, the tree of life, the maybe a phase transition between a network and, uh, and a tree, uh, chirality. And as a physicist uh, going into biology, uh, I know very well that there are some questions that I can't ask and expect answers to because they are detail dependent, very important uh, details to the chemistry, the, the history, and so on. But there's other questions that are more dynamical and are therefore, because they're shared by all life, regardless of their origin and uh, their history, one has a chance to try to understand these general principles. And that, I think, is one of the roles of, uh, of physicists uh, in, uh, in biology, and in fact, the way in which interdisciplinary science uh, can be done. So let me now tell you then what I mean uh, by universal biology. I'm not going to actually uh, explain what the solution to this is. I'm going to set out a kind of program, a way of thinking about biology, which is uh, perhaps surprising to people when they first hear it. So let's start with a, a headline. So this is a headline that came out uh, uh, some, uh, some months ago, maybe a, a year or two ago. This was the, uh, the mystery of the missing waves on Titan. And uh, so the missing waves on Titan was, we know that there are oceans on Titan. Uh, we know that there is wind on Titan. And so we know, because we understand the principles of fluid mechanics, that there should be waves on those oceans. And they weren't observed. And we couldn't see them. And then some time later, there was a great, uh, uh, it was, it was a great discovery. Cassini, the wonderful uh, mission that uh, is, is currently doing wonders around uh, uh, the, the moons of Saturn. Cassini spies uh, wind-rippled waves on Titan. So everything is all right. Uh, the laws of physics work, and what we expected to see uh, were eventually observed when you looked uh, appropriately. So that's just, uh, this just says that uh, we know that those waves are missing because we have a general theory of two-phase fluid flow interfaces that predicts waves and even their dispersion characteristics. How about this headline? Okay. Mystery of the missing life on Titan. Okay, why do we never see that headline? 
Okay? And then you know, maybe this one, Cassini spies the long-sought life on Titan. Never seen that one, at least not yet. Maybe we will one day uh, with en Enceladus rather than Titan there. Okay? So why do we never see a, a headline like that? Well, we don't know if there is missing life because we don't have a theory that even predicts the existence of life as a physical phenomenon. Everything else we know in science, we understand two things about it. First of all, why the phenomenon can actually occur, and then secondly, how it can occur under specific situations. And we don't even have an understanding of how the phenomenon of life actually occurs and is a consequence of laws of physics or, and so on. So we don't, can't make that headline, and we don't understand how life can arise in different environments. In fact, that I think is really uh, the goal of uh, astrobiology, is to actually understand life First of all, in terms of general principles that are not specific historical contingency, carbon chemistry details, we want to understand a theory of universal biology, a theory of systems biology, that can be applied to different environments divorced from particular idiosyncratic details. So what is universal biology? Of course, we don't have a theory of that, so let's talk about something where we do have a theory, and that would be universal computation. So let me now tell you about universal computation. So here's a computer, right? It's a computer made out of plastic and silicon and, 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 uh, and metals and various things like this. Okay? Here's another computer. This one is made out of cogwheels and levers and springs, and it's on display at the Science Museum in London and at the Museum of Computation in Mountain View, California. These two things are the same. They do the same thing. There's a, a wonderful video on YouTube where you can see this thing actually working. They both can do computation. A computer is not this, and a computer is not this. It's an abstract concept. It's a Turing machine with a von Neumann architecture, and it can be instantiated in many ways. It can be instantiated in the world of cogwheels and springs. It can be instantiated in the world of, of val fermionic valves, relays, and electrical switches, it can be instantiated in the worlds of silicon chips. So it is the abstraction that is what a computer, computer is, not the platform on which it is, uh, it is realized. So in other words, the medium is not the message. All of these different types of computer, the Babbage machine, the modern uh, laptop, uh, von Neumann's early uh, computer uh, at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, they're all the same thing, uh, but the medium is not the message. So what is the message? Well, when you think about universal biology, you want to think in a similar way about what is the abstraction of which biology that we see is the representation of. Now, Schrodinger and Del Brook, they were the earliest physicists to work in biology, and their partial motivation was to actually find new physical laws. In fact, they thought the new laws would be laws of quantum mechanics, which, I, which may or may not turn out to be true, uh, but uh, that was their motivation. Now, from my perspective, and, and indeed uh, Carl Wozer's, uh, we didn't really feel that the, the new physical laws would come from quantum mechanics and so on. What we wanted to understand was, why does life exist in the first place? And that those laws would be laws of statistical physics, the emergence and existence of life itself from rules that describe what happens at lower levels. In other words, how does matter self-organize hierarchically to create replicating evolvable structures without anybody having to push the start button? How do molecules come to life? So really we want to understand biology in the way that we understand physics, we want to understand the existence of the phenomenon and then how it's specifically realized. And the thing that we emphasize the most is that what biological systems do is that they reprogram themselves. They're not like everything else we see in physics. They reprogram themselves on the fly, and that's what we mean by evolution. So this was realized very early on. I showed you a picture a few minutes ago of John von Neumann's first computer. That computer was mostly used to, to run bomb codes. It was mostly used to design uh, hydrogen bombs, and that's why it was funded by, uh, by the US government. But at night time, when the engineers went home, Niels Baricelli went and uh, got time on the machine, and he ran codes that simulated what we would today call uh, computer viruses. 
He simulated little organisms that could reproduce, that they could mutate, they could move around and uh, interact with each other, and he just produced printouts uh, and looked at the structures, and I'm not going to be able to translate this for you, but what he was seeing was an early example of self-replicating, mutating, self-organizing digital organisms inside the computer that, uh, that manifested many of the properties of, of living systems. Today, there's a wonderful and thriving field of digital life, artificial life, where people, uh, physicists and computer scientists, try to understand the principles of life by doing these simple numerical experiments. So if you want a bumper sticker for life, it's this. The program is the data. The data is the program. I, I know data is a plural verb, a plural noun, but never mind that. So the program is the data. The data is the program. It can constantly rewrites itself. And that's what's interesting about it. It means that self-programming systems have the capacity to evolve. Evolving systems reprogram themselves, and they're able to respond to perturbations by creating new functionality. Physical systems don't do that. So the physical systems you learn about them in elementary physics, they obey Newton's equations of motion. Once you specify the forces or the energy of the system, everything is predetermined. But biological systems are different from that because they reprogram themselves on the fly. And what that means is that the future state of an evolvable system is inherently unpredictable, maybe even unpredictable in a certain uh, pure mathematical sense. That's something we're working on right now. But this is what makes it very difficult to control evolving systems. When we, as, uh, as engineers, biological engineers, try to intervene in biological systems, medicine, agriculture, uh, insecticides, uh, what happens is this. Within a few years, the biological system evolves the ability to defeat our attempts to intervene it. And this isn't an accident. This isn't something that is a rare thing that only bacteria do, we, the emergence of antibiotic resistance. We have antibiotic resistance, insecticide resistance, herbicide resistance. Biological systems inherently are difficult to control because they can evolve around what you, the constraints you put on it because their, their dimensionality is not constrained. This even applies to systems that are not biological, but have the characteristics of living systems, maybe even financial markets. Okay? Good luck with trying to regulate financial markets. Good luck with trying to figure out what's going to happen with financial markets by adjusting the short-term interest rate. Even when the smartest economists in the country try to do that, often the effect on the term structure of interest rates is completely the opposite of what they intended. They're evolving systems. Markets are evolving systems. And this idea of self-programming systems is a generic aspect of biological systems. So if we want to understand biology in a deep way, we have to come to terms with the fact that the dynamics and their physics is, is very different from what we're used to. Now, universal biology has an inverse problem. For computation, let me tell you the history lesson. How were computers invented? They were invented in the following way. Alan Turing came up with the abstract theory of computers. I think most people in the room know what a Turing machine is. And he came up with a mathematical theory of that. And then later on, they were created by John von Neumann at the Institute for Advanced Study, literally taking the mathematical theory, finding what were you, how could you construct machines and circuits in the real world that would be elements of that theory. And that's how the first computers were built. They were built to explicitly realize an abstract mathematical principle. Now, let's suppose that you were given a modern computer. And I just said to you, Here's the computer. Can you work backwards from your Apple computer or your Android phone or something? Can you work backwards and deduce the abstract theory of computation, the one that Alan Turing invented in the 1930s? Well, it probably would be really, really hard to do that because you'd be bewildered by the complexity of the circuits and the construction and so on, and you wouldn't know what was important and what was not. In biology, we have this inverse problem. The biology is already created, and we want to understand what is the abstract theory of what it is an instantiation. This abstract theory is the principles behind all systems that exhibit the characteristics of life, and we don't currently have an understanding of it, but it's something that we need to do if we want to understand properly how, to, uh, how biological systems respond. So as a physicist, sometimes people ask me, you know, why are you wasting your time doing biology? It's all chemistry, and it's messy and dirty and, and stuff like that. I disagree completely. Uh, there's a wonderful quote from Stan Ulam, one of the uh, developers of the hydrogen bomb, sadly. Uh, but he, what he, uh, he said this, paraphrased um, uh, President Kennedy, ask not what physics can do for biology. 
People always think about what physics can do for biology. Better microscopes, better mathematical techniques, and so on. That's not very important. That's, that's good and great, but the really interesting question was what biology can do for physics. What I've told you is what biology does for physics. It's a completely new set of problems, a, a kind of dynamical system that is unprecedented anywhere else in the universe. And it's important. It's a really important problem. So Carl and I wrote this up uh, and, and, and various other aspects of this in, in one one-page review article, which a Penny showed something of uh, yesterday evening, and then another one, um, which is published in the Annual Reviews of uh, Condensed Matter Physics. All right, so that's a little bit about what we try to do with universal biology. It's something active going on in my group, uh, but, uh, and one can actually translate these rather general ideas into mathematical concepts, but of course I'm not going to uh, do that for you today. I want to now talk about work that actually was done, uh, uh, started uh, uh, with, uh, with Carl, and may be new to some of you. And uh, there's parts of this that are new that are unpublished, which were done uh, with uh, Tommaso Biancalani, who is a, a postdoc in our uh, institute until, uh, until last week or so. So this is Carl uh, in, uh, in uh, sometime around the 1970s. He wrote a famous letter to Francis Crick, which, uh, which uh, is... Um, um, which we uh, published in, in, in one of our uh, papers. And in this letter, he, he sets forth to Francis Crick his idea for how one could try to understand the early history of life. What he's interested in, in particular, is the evolution of the simplest cells. In those days, he still called them prokaryotic. And, uh, and he lays out here his fascinating program uh, for uh, how to do this. If you want to know what uh, Crick responded, please go to the gatehouse at the IGB. You'll see the woes exhibit there, and you can see facsimiles of this letter and the, and the, and the response there. So it's, uh, it, it's a very fascinating story. As I said last night in my introduction, Carl really understood how, this, uh, how his program would play out. Now, what does simple mean? So simple, of course, means early because evolution takes simple things and makes them more complex. So if you want to look at simple things, you have to look at, at, uh, at early life. And uh, the thing about uh, universality, if you want to look at universal properties of living systems, universality is, by definition, something that is not idiosyncratic not specific to particular details. Therefore, it must arise from collective effects because individual features are subsumed by system-wide properties. So when we look for universal properties, we look for collective effects as physicists because that's how we can try to make models that capture the important dynamics of systems without getting hung up on the details. Now, one example of that was our model of the evolution of the genetic code, and I want to spend a few minutes talking about that. So here's the tree of life that you've all seen and we've discussed uh, at length this morning. Uh, this is uh, from uh, the uh, Wozenfox paper in 1977, uh, and what I want to point out here is that very early on they realized that the, there was a really interesting problem, which is this. The, the root of the phylogenetic tree is about 3.8 billion years. The planet is about 4.6 billion years old. So that means that life had less than a billion years at most, probably a lot less than a billion years, to actually evolve the complexity of the modern cell. It had to be the complexity of the modern cell because if it wasn't something like translation fully developed, we wouldn't be able to do molecular phylogeny in the first place. So the question is then a, a question of rapid evolution. Here's the start of life. Here's uh, the evolution of the genetic code. Here's the last universal common ancestor. All of this important stuff had to have been developed very, very rapidly. And the question is, how did life evolve from zero to the modern cell in much less than a billion years? Fast and furious evolution. So the answer is uh, also uh, prophetically contained in another paper from 1977 by Wozenfox. But this paper is one that is much less read, and, and, I, and I think it should be read much more because it, it's an absolutely wonderful uh, paper. It's a theory paper. It's called The Concept of Cellular Evolution. It was published in the Journal of Molecular Evolution. And, uh, and in this paper, they, they, they really tried to imagine what life would have been like and how life could have evolved. In particular, Carl was very interested in, in, in this idea of the tempo and mode of evolution. This was something that D.G. Simpson had written about, and, and they wrote that uh, it's more it, to, in order to understand the speed of evolution, it's important to assume that the mode and not the tempo of evolution changed. In other words, the character of the evolutionary process itself was different, rather than just being regular vertical Darwinian evolution on fast forward. And we'll see that, in fact, that was a very prophetic 
uh, idea because it turns out to be true, and uh, at least as far as we can tell, by trying to do actual uh, mathematical models of the evolution of the genetic code. All right, so let me very quickly remind you, here's the genetic code. I think everybody in this room doesn't need to see it again. Uh, everybody knows that the genetic code is organized in its chemical properties, uh, the most hydrophobic amino acids up here, the most hydrophilic ones there. And in fact, uh, Carl, back in the, the middle 1960s, already had measured those properties uh, with his, uh, his, his what he calls the polar requirements. And so we have now uh, a single number that represents the gradation of properties throughout the genetic code table. Now, the thing about the genetic code that you may not know is this. Everybody knows that the genetic code is universal. Every organism on the planet has, with some minor exceptions, more or less the same uh, genetic code. But the other thing that's interesting about it is that it is optimal in minimizing errors. So what do we mean by this? So here is a, a calculation that was done uh, back in the middle 1990s by Hagen Hurst and many other people since then. And the idea is this. Let's suppose I take the, the genetic code table, and now I permute the labels of the amino acids that are, are being coded for. How many ways can I do that? 20 factorial, which is about 10 to the 18. Okay, that's too many genetic codes to, uh, to actually deal with, but of course you can sample them uh, in a computer by Monte Carlo simulation. And so one can generate synthetic genetic codes in a computer. The next thing you need to know is, how good is a genetic code at minimizing errors? And the answer to that is, you can just ask, take a number that represents the, the, uh, the polar requirement of each uh, amino acid. As you swap amino acids in the genetic code table, sum the squares of the differences of those things, and you will get a score, a number, and you can add it up over every position in the genetic code table, and so you can get a figure of merit that tells you how good each genetic code is at minimizing errors. If you were to, if you were to have a, a mutation or a misreading and you got the wrong amino acid, is the amino acid you get close in chemical properties to the one you should have got, or is it very different? Genetic codes that have a small value for that error estimate are good ones. Genetic codes that have a large value are bad ones. And then you can, uh, you can do this many times for, for as many synthetic genetic codes as you can sample, and then you can get a number. And this, by the way, is nice to... to uh, to, um, you'll see Rob Knight to give a talk later on in, in, the, in, in this meeting on metagenomics, but his influence in this field uh, goes, goes way back uh, uh, earlier to that, to his PhD work with, uh, with Laura Landwehr. So uh, it's nice to show a picture from his thesis in my talk. So here's the example of what you would get if you looked at the probability distribution of the, the figure of merit. Uh, a frozen accident, a random code, would give you a distribution like this. Uh, and if the actual genetic code is in the middle there, that says the genetic code is basically something that's one, you know, that's basically something that you would get at random. If, on the other hand, the actual genetic code has a score which is very different from what you get at random, that shows that it has evolved. And the actual result is that the genetic code is, as Freeland and Hurst put it in their paper, one in a million. If you take a million genetic codes and calculate what is their, how good they are at minimizing errors, the actual genetic code is better than all of those. Okay, now what we did, what we contributed to this, was we understood how this happened. And the way it happens is, uh, is, is the following. Uh, we learned that uh, we, we made a dynamical system model of how a code can evolve. Now, how, code, how codes can evolve is actually rather complicated to explain uh, because um, you, know, you might think a code can't evolve. The answer turns out to do with the fact that early organisms when they did translation, the proteins that were produced were not unique. You produced a whole distribution of proteins, and because you have a whole probability distribution, it's possible to find, uh, uh, the, as, the, as the genetic code evolves, you can still recognize the correct proteins that, that are being coded for, and so the life doesn't die. That's how you get around Francis Crick's uh, frozen accident uh, uh, idea that codes cannot evolve. Okay, so there's some mathematics. Here's what we did. Just like Baricelli did in his uh, early Institute for Advanced Study uh, calculation of digital life, we did a sort of souped up version of that. We had an asexual population of evolving, reproducing digital organisms. Uh, they have a phenotype, which is a function of their distribution of their proteins. The proteins are obtained by, by translating a genome with some code, with errors. The individual reproduction rate is a function of fitness, and uh, the code uh, then can evolve, and the organisms can evolve. 
So the idea is the organisms evolve in complexity, the code co-evolves along with the, uh, with the evolution of complexity. And what do you find when you do this? We did two experiments, one where there is no horizontal gene transfer and one where there is. With horizontal gene transfer, the codes evolve and the code quality gets better and better. But when you just do regular vertical Darwinian evolution, what happens is the codes get stuck. You get these frozen accidents. The codes never uh, manage to evolve. They get stuck in local minima. And so you get something that is like random codes. So what you learn is, however you try to do this experiment, the only way that you can get a genetic code that has this error-minimizing optimality property is if you have collective effects, horizontal gene transfer. Similarly, if you ask how many codes are there in the, in the simulation, what you find is that codes, you never get a unique code unless you switch on horizontal gene transfer. And so what we learned is that horizontal gene transfer leads to universality. Only if there is a phase of life where it is dominated by, by a horizontal gene transfer, by collective effects, can you evolve life that has a genetic code of the sort that we actually observe today. Now, how do we escape this uh, collective phase of life, the one that Rose and Fox call the progenote? Well, it turns out that you can study that by digital organisms too. So I'm not going to go through the details. We simulated organisms which can reproduce and mutate. They have a fitness landscape. We do horizontal gene transfer at random. And what we discovered, and this is un unpublished work, is that if you start off with a progenote phase, the system basically drives itself into a phase where you then encounter vertical evolution and, and the formation of individual organismal lineages. And this happens because once a structure becomes so complex, it's very, very unlikely that a horizontal gene transfer event is going to produce something that is going to improve it. And so very complex systems get locked in and then make a transition to a vertical evolution phase of life. So there's a natural driving of the system from a collective phase of life to a vertical individual-based phase of life. That's what we see that was in the Institute for Universal Biology logo. I want to spend the last three minutes and 40 seconds talking about uh, homochirality. So that's the other uh, universal aspect of life. So homochirality is the following. If you look at all the amino acids, uh, at least the chiral ones, they are left-handed. If you look at the biological sugars, they're all right-handed. There's no chemical reason why they have to be like that. And this effect is not just a small bias. It's a 100% effect. Okay. How could this happen? How can such a huge signal occur, and, and what is the reason for this? It hasn't been explained up to now, and I'm not going to be able to explain it in a detail that is in, in, of chemical accuracy, but I can show you something about the processes that must have given rise to that. So this is work that is about to be published in, um, in Physical Review Letters, um, so uh, let me tell you about that. So the basic idea of the theory is this. If you have early life, if life gets started, every theory of life says there has to have been some kind of autocatalysis, autocatalysis of metabolism, autocatalysis of the organisms in order to evolve and replicate. Autocatalysis is represented by these equations here, some, uh, some, uh, some species that is not chiral, and then uh, a, a, a D and, and a, a, a right and left-handed um, uh, chiral version. So these are, these are self-replicating autocatalytic reactions meant to indicate chemical processes that produce chiral molecules. The basic idea is that if you have an initial chiral bias, initial handedness, that will then grow exponentially as autocatalysis proceeds, as life uh, evolves. The problem is that when you formulate that mathematically, it doesn't seem to work. At least that's what happened when Frank did it in his paper in 1953. And to make it work, he had to put in some extra condition, which is called a chiral inhibition or mutual antagonism. And when you do that, then when you write down the, the equations for, for this, which I'm not going to go through in detail, what you find is that life can exist in one of two possible states, left-handed or right-handed, and somehow the system makes a choice between those two. And he explained how that could happen in his model. The problem is that that's wrong, okay? And the reason it's wrong is that this effect of choosing between these things does not come from the autocatalysis. It comes, it's an artifact of the extra terms that he put into the equation to try to force there to be these two stable states. So what we discovered, and I'm not going to go through this in, in any detail, is that if you start off with a system that doesn't force there to be two states, 
just has one state, the achiral state, you can still get homochirality emerging. And the mechanism is a very surprising one. It's one that not, has not been seen before. Uh, and, and I'm going to skip uh, these parts of the slide. What I'm going to show you is, um, is, is this. This quantity here tells you how chiral the system is. If it's zero, then it's not chiral. If it's one, it's right-handed. If it's minus one, it's left-handed. This equation is derived using stochastic mathematics from a model very similar to Frank's model, but including the recycling of the constituents. So trust me that this model is, is, this is, this is the correct equation. This part is the part that says the system tries to go downhill to a state where there is no chirality. This part here is the effect of the noise. It's the fluctuations in the number of chemical reactants in the system. Now, what's important about this is that the prefactor of this is a term which we called alpha, which is the ratio of non-order catalytic to order catalytic production in the system. What it says is the following. As life gets started, autocatalysis becomes more and more efficient, and this term gets larger and larger, and uh, gets smaller and smaller and smaller. As it gets smaller and smaller and smaller, what that does is it drives the system from a state, from a state which is achiral to a state which is chiral, and it does that without any uh, initial um, bias. So the system will automatically drive itself to a chiral state. So what do you learn from this? Is that, uh, is that order catalysis uh, alone, when modeled mathematically in the correct way, can inexorably give rise to global homochirality in the biological system as a consequence of autocatalysis. So that's wonderful. And the reason it's wonderful is it means that homochirality should be a universal feature of life. And one can use it as a biosignature for looking at life elsewhere in the universe. All right, so that's my conclusion. So what I've talked about very quickly in this, uh, in this overview is I've talked about homochirality, the genetic code, and the Darwinian transition. And what I've shown you is that autocatalysis leads to 100% homochirality. I've told you that, homo, that um, horizontal gene transfer drives the evolution of a unique and optimal genetic code. And I've shown you that the horizontal gene transfer eventually forces itself into a regime where it becomes ineffective compared to vertical selection. So I want to uh, thank uh, the members of the biocomplexity theme uh, for their support and, uh, and all, everything that they've taught me about biology over the last uh, 10 years. Here are members of the biocomplexity theme all looking in the right direction, in this case, looking at the camera. And, uh, and uh, with that, uh, I, I thank you. I'll be happy to take any questions. That, yes, yeah, so, so the question was, uh, so I didn't actually say the Turing machines would become more and more complex, but the question is, how do you see the complexity of organisms? And I di actually didn't have time to put this slide in, but, the, but uh, I want to reiterate what George, George said. So he said the ribosome does show the increase in complexity, and there's a, I think it's on one of the slides I had, um, you can see that, uh, the, I think in the quote with you, with you on it, um, there is a, a statement that, uh, the, um, let, me, let me try to find it, because it's really, it's really, oh, it's really wonderful. Um, there's the other one with you. This one. Um, I don't know if I can find it. I, I probably misread it. There's, there's a statement in one of your papers that, uh, that, com that the, the, right, the reason the ribosome must be so big is because of complexity. And there's a wonderful plot in uh, one of uh, Petrov et al.'s papers, the ones that uh, George Fox talked about in, uh, in the previous talk, uh, which you didn't show the picture. It shows the large subunits of, of, of the ribosome uh, plotted for the different uh, domains of life and the different, and different uh, uh, species. And what you see in this is incredible. You see the tripartite structure of life uh, in the size of the large subunits, splitting into bacteria, archaea, and eukaryote. And you see right at the top of that, human. 
Okay? And so if you want to know, how do you, is, the, is the ribosome a Turing machine or a computer, I think of the ribosome and translation as being more like a compiler. And the complexity of the compiler uh, increases with the complexity of the instruction set that it has to execute. And so looking at the large subunit is exactly the way that one can quantify the increase of complexity in biological systems. And, and your paper actually uh, shows that, shows the first data that, that indicates this, but it hasn't been systematically understood and it should be. So thanks for your question. Yes. I, uh, Yes, so, what, so the question was, did I say autocatalysis leads to, to uh, homochirality? So I, I, d I don't know that there's no other mechanism, but I know that f I can show that from autocatalysis you can get homochirality, and of course, which one you get, D versus L, is, is not specified. That's a historical accident. Um, just, that just depends on the history of, of the fluctuations. Okay? But just to be able to show the existence is, 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 is important, and to have the argument right. Yeah, so the question was, could, in, in one of my pictures up here, here it is, I, sh I put homochirality as occurring there. And you're asking, could homochirality have occurred somewhere over here, right? And, and I think that's a really interesting idea. Actually, my prejudice was that that would be what happened. In fact, I liked an idea um, by Ruth Bernstein, though the paper is wrong, but the, but the idea was that actually there was never an RNA world, early life was an ecosystem, and that uh, the amplifier of homochirality was in fact the translation machinery itself and, and, and enzymes. And I think it's a very attractive idea, but the proposal in his paper is, is technically doesn't, doesn't make any sense to me. Um, so I think I'd, I would love to talk about that because nothing in the mechanism I showed you, the mathematical mechanism, excludes that possibility. It's, it's, this is just a dynamical systems mechanism for how such things can occur. It doesn't say when they occur, what the different types of molecules are that create them and so on. So the, the theory I showed you is agnostic to that, to that timing, and I think it would be wonderful if it was, if it was connected to this as well. We, we, Carl and I talked about that many times, but, uh, and we tried, and uh, Bashi Jafapur, who was a student who worked with me very on this and whose work, thesis work this is, um, you know, we, we tried very hard to see if we could find a way to make that work. Right now, we don't know how to do it. Somewhere around here, yeah. yeah. The, the data that are now published by this company, Noxa, mm -hmm. in Berlin, uses the opposite chirality RNA. They make proteins that are the wrong amino acids. They make captains that are the wrong thing, yeah. the right thing. And then they make the wrong thing, and they work with the natural proteins. And so you, they are a Yes. So, right, so when we talk about uh, that, the picture that I was showing you, all we're talking about is a horizontal gene transfer of the core components of the cell, the translational machinery. It doesn't mean that antibiotic resistance genes cannot be horizontally transferred as well. So, it, so we, we, all, all we're really talking about are core cellular uh, components. And actually, one of the experiments that, uh, that we're doing in, in, in the institute, in the office next door to yours, Isaac Khan uh, and his group are actually trying to look at the replication machinery to see whether that has gone through the Darwinian transition or not. So you can have the Darwinian transition be, have been surpassed um, by some components of the cell and not by others. So just the fact that the, the, the translational machinery is not undergoing a massive horizontal gene transfer certainly doesn't mean that something else uh, d does not. And, we, and we've heard about that from Gary this morning and so on. So I think that's the answer to your question. Uh, so you 
you've shown that the time to limit code that you have is optimal in minimizing errors, but you started from a specific set of amino acids and nucleotides. Yes. But that has specific chemical properties. Does it mean that, um, in some sense, universality comes from specific? Okay, so the question was uh, when I was uh, talking about uh, the, the optimal parts of the genetic code, we were talking about the 20 amino acids that are, that are used in biology, and in fact also the other thing, that uh, the other piece of uh, wool that I pulled over your eyes was the degeneracy structure of the genetic code. So, so no, the, the argument uh, does, does not require um, those particular amino acids. Uh, in fact, um, you know, what those amino acids are, what order they put into the code, how many of them there are, those are the sorts of questions that I think the physics simply does not, uh, uh, is not suited to un understanding and does not attempt to answer. Now, whether the, the evidence for the genetic code being optimal, being based on those amino acids, and, and most importantly, the biggest thing is that degeneracy structure. So I, it's, I show that because it's the only calculation that anybody has ever been able to do. Okay, so you could say, well, could you do a, that same kind of Monte Carlo calculation with a different type of genetic code, say a doublet genetic code, and I've done that and found nothing special happens. It only happens with the triplet uh, uh, genetic code, and it only happens with the measured amino acids that, that we've looked at. And in fact, um, one of the nice things in Rob Knight's uh, PhD thesis was repeating those early experiments, but also repeating the calculations with other measures of, uh, of amino acids. And again, it's only the, the polar requirement and other chemical properties which are kind of morally equivalent to it for which the genetic code seems to be optimal. So that's one of the reasons why we think that this is a signature of very early life, something that was baked in right at the beginning of the uh, development of the genetic code as a translational system. Um, so, so the argument doesn't prove that the, the, the genetic code is like this, but certainly we can only do what we can with the existing unique genetic code. Okay, does that answer your question? Okay. You know, I have a quick question. So there is a 21st amino acid, Yes, yeah. Well, well, so right. So, so we were very careful when we wrote down the dynamical system model to not tie it to the particular framework. We're trying to understand what are the dynamical processes that can cause codes to evolve in the first place. And um, so, the simulations that we did are agnostic as to whether you have 20 amino acids or 21 or 22. Um, it's just simply how in principle is it possible for a code to evolve because. The, you know, Crick's argument was, if a code evolves, then the messages stop making sense. The messages are the proteins. The proteins stop making sense, your organism is suboptimal, or it just simply dies. So therefore, biological codes cannot evolve. And, th and the answer to that was, well, the original genetic code was floppy, and it produced statistical proteins. And somewhere in, the, in that mess of statistical proteins was the right one. And it's the co-evolution of the code with the organism that enables this dynamical system to work and produce a unique and optimal code. So we were trying to model just the process, not the specific way in which the, the different actual amino acids are coming to us. OK? Any uh, other questions, comments? If not, thank you.